here's the machine that I need to design a new part for. Let's check out what it looks like right now. What? How could they have chosen to add a hydrocoptic marshal vein? Let's check the documentation. Yes. It's even in the schematic. Weird. This would clearly need a wane shaft. You know what? I don't know why they put this in, but I'll just stick it back in and design something new around it. What? How could they have chosen to add a hydrocoptic marzel vein? Yeah, it's even in the schematic. Weird. This machine would clearly need a wane shaft. You know what? I don't know why they put it in, but I'll just remove it and design something new. What you saw me doing just now is a situation you can encounter easily in many design situations. Be it in code or in physical hardware such as electronics and mechanics. You need to change an existing design and find something in there that is making your eyebrows raise. Now you have two choices. Blindly accept the design and work around it. Or blindly change the design without knowing the consequences. Of course, you'd like to have neither of those, and that's what architecture decision records are for. Most designs are badly documented. What is documented is often how it is built, but not why it is built the way it is built. In the worst case, you only have oral history, and what started out as a clear picture of the circumstances and the reasons for a design decision starts to degrade over time. It's difficult to trace who was involved in the project and only a, a gist of what once was a well-made design decision remains. Most designers don't like to write large documents and you probably don't like to read large documents before starting a redesign. A solution for this was thought of by Michael Nygaard. He proposed to write small documents that describe the most important design decisions. Whenever you or your team takes a decision that has a large influence on the structure of your design, you write a short piece of text, usually around one page A4, that describes what decision was taken, what the context was in which the decision was taken, what the consequences of that decision are, and what the status of the decision is. Let's go by these parts in a bit more detail. The decision is written in active voice and only the decision is written down. Now let's pause a moment and look at the active voice. The difference between active and passive voice is the sequence of words. But it also really stresses the decision you make. When designing a car in passive voice I'd say a steering wheel is used by the car, which sounds fine as a decision. In active voice I'd say the car uses a steering wheel and now we can see a problem. For what does it use that? What kind of steering wheel? We need to be more specific. For example, the steering wheel changes the car's direction. Ok, this might sound like vague linguistics, but I find it very hard to do correctly. And using the active voice forces me to think what the real decision is. And I say it forces because it causes pain in my brain when I do this. So, let's try this out for a moment. Cecile, do you have a decision for me? A microcontroller will be used in the steering wheel. Ok, a microcontroller will be used in the steering wheel. So, that's passive voice. Um, is, is it used for the steering action, um, the, the for, for handling the switches? Um, it handles the... Uh, the microcontroller communicates the horn switch status to the engine controller. Yes, that's, that's actually pretty nice. Maybe it's a bit too long, but something like this. So, to recap, not hydrocoptic marzal vanes could be added to turbo encabulators, but the turbo encabulator uses hydrocoptic marzal vanes to prevent side fumbling. Or we will use ADRs to describe architectural decisions. Or the controllers will be written in C++ using the boost frameworks. Hmm, those were two decisions, weren't they? Be sure that your decision is only one decision. The rest are consequences and I'll go there in a minute. The decision is also the title of the ADR. This way, if you look through a list of ADRs, 
you can see all decisions at a glance. To the title, we add a following number to see what decisions were taken in what order. I'll get back to that later. The next section is the context in which the decision was taken. For example, whether it was taken in high time pressure, or whether many stakeholders were given input, or whether the project was more about design exploration than actually making something reliable. The last large section is what consequences of the decision are. For instance, what alternatives were not chosen and what does that mean for future developments? Or did you choose a very good solution that nobody yet fully knows and understands, so you need training? Anything that follows out of your decision. Each ADR also has a status. Most people use proposed, accepted, deprecated and superseded or something like that. One of the rules Michael Nygaard stated was that after you and your team agree on your decision, that ADR is immutable. You can't change it anymore. If you come back to your decision, you write a new ADR with the current context and the new consequences. And the old one now gets the status superseded by and refers to the new one. Because of the numbers in the title, you can see when a decision was superseded. Now here comes the nice part. Writing down these documents does not cost a lot of time and getting agreement on the decisions enhances the awareness of yourself and your team on why you're building, what you're building, the way you're building it. As you go on doing this, you create a library of decisions. Depending on the size of your design, this can be from 10 to 100 decisions. When a few years from now someone changes your design, the new designer can read why this hydrocoptic marzal vein was inserted and can check whether it's still a good design choice based on the situation at that moment. But wait, there's more. Now imagine that you are the new hire on a design team that's currently working on a design and you can read through the ADRs that were already there you'd be quite aware of why this damn robot looks the way it does. Besides that, you actually know quite well in what kind of project you have landed. What I explained in this video is the basic idea of an ADR. Many design teams have made their own templates that have a slightly different take on this. You can take a look at adr.github.io for many templates and also for tooling to maintain them. But to me, the most important part is not the tooling or the exact formulation. What is important for ADRs to be useful is the idea behind them. During a design, you make lots of decisions. If you document the most important ones, you're making it easier for your future self and your future colleagues to make useful changes. I hope that this video was clear to you. In the following video, I will describe some of the challenges and questions that arise from using ADRs.